morning. It's a lot. We are starting our session basically right away. Please take your seat. We are getting started right away. Social responsibility, um, or let's just call it CSR for short, so we don't have to keep going back at it. Today, I have three distinguished panelists to share their thoughts, to share their experience, and share their insights on CSR. As you probably already know, Canada is seen as an international leader in the environmental sustainability and global social responsibility, or at least we Canadians like it to think that we are. It is probably due to the uh, nature of our economy being, uh, being very uh, strong in, uh, in extract, extractable industries such as mining, oil and gas, uh, forestry, fishing, etc. Uh, we have uh, created quite a footprint on the environment over the years and we have come to the realization that we need to make our environment and our business and our industries sustainable. The topic of CSR is also very, very relevant to China, a country today which is at a crossroad between, on the one hand, human and economic development, and on the other hand, environmental protection. As you can see, the topic today, the name of our session today is Good Business is Big Business. It does not mean that CSR does apply only to big business. CSR applies to business of all sorts. It is just that we like to believe that good CSR would create business which makes big contributions, business which would bring big heart to the community. We have, I would like to take this time to introduce our panelists as well. Their bio are already included in your booklet. Nevertheless, We'll have Dr. Uh, um, Clément Lantier from the Calgary Zoo. Um, and also we have uh, to Dr. Lantier's right is Mr. Jim Zhang. He is a, not only an entrepreneur, but also a activist, philanthropist, um, uh, uh, brings uh, a wealth of experience on both sides of the fence, and also Mr. Brian Tuft, he is the, uh, the he heads up the operation of Sinopec in Canada. Uh, so these are all entities which we are very, very which are very very well known to us. To get things started, perhaps I'm going to each ask each panelist a question, and they, after they have responded to the question, I encourage you in the crowd to write down what questions you might have and give it to one of the CCDC uh, staff and they will pass the question to us for discussion by panelists or panelists. So I'll start with, uh, I'll kick off with uh, Dr. Clement Montiel of Calgary Zoo. Uh, Clement, one of the pillars of CSR is environmental stewardship. In that context, it seems every day we hear, and we just discussed about that yesterday, we hear all these problematic issues about different species of animals coming to extinction. And, I, and uh, things are certainly not getting any better. 
they're probably, uh, this world, this, this, the, the planet is probably getting so much worse for different kinds of animals, whether on land, whether in the air, or whether under the water. The problem of this rapid extinction of species and ruined ecosystem can seem simply overwhelming. Such a big problem requires monumental solution. Yoshiwama,这个有希望吗?这个有希望吗?这个有希望吗?这个有希望吗?这个有希望吗?这个有希望吗?这个有希望吗?这个有希望吗?这个有希望吗?这个有希望吗?这个有希望吗?这个有希
uh, you work as a gangbu, you work in a uh, SOE, you work in a multinational company, you were an entrepreneur, very successful entrepreneur of a listed company yourself. What prompted you to shift here and assume the responsibility with entities such as the uh, Foundation and more importantly, the nature of conservancy uh, of, of China? And uh, how did you get all started? Not only your travel, well, not only your journey, but also the journey of uh, TNC. Thank you. Oh. And uh, before I answer that, I'd like to thank you for the first question. Uh, what is the most uh, uh, factor, most important factor to affect uh, our nature? I think it's a human, the greedy human. Uh, for example, in China, since before, uh, whenever when we had this kind of banquet uh, tonight, there was always a shark fin shoe to be served, uh, served for the VIP guests as a top standard. So that's caused Every year, over 100 billion shark in the ocean to be killed only because of fees. And uh, a few years ago, we work out, try to promote people, uh, community, educated people, don't take shark fee. But uh, not so much uh, efficiency, because majority of the consumer is a government in China. And Chinese government and banking. So we, as a group of uh, socialists, uh, we organize a lobby or to Chinese and People's Congress twice, asking, stop, provide, spend our taxpayers' money for shark fee. So two years later, after the new government, Xi Jinping, get on the ground, the, the internal law passed. No any government body or organization allowed to serve any shark fin show and uh, in the state banquet or any kind of uh, reception. From that day on, 85% of the shark in the ocean had been have been served and uh, uh, massive killing had been reduced. So I worked for that. I got uh, twice international award to be shark guard and uh, also global shark guard from the UK. Are you a lawyer? I'm not, but I know how to do the lobby, uh, lobby work, law work in China. Back to the question, CSR is uh, important to bring the company into good business. I was in the uh, multinational company, global company, Ericsson, in year 1997. I was in charge. I was uh, uh, assigned as a CMO for Ericsson China uh, to bring up the CSR. At that time, I could say, CSR is uh, something new in Chinese uh, society. People always say, if we can pay the tax, can employ more people, we are a good uh, company. Uh, in that year, uh, China suffered from a big national-wide flood. So I was representing Ericsson to stand up as a first a global company, uh, donate uh, 3 million emergency uh, communication equipment for their Yangtze River uh, alum side for their uh, government. Then we promote a CSR. The company should follow to the call with the society needs. Then CSR also had been awarded, continues for five years to be the best CSR company in China. And uh, that's also bring Ericsson into very good uh, uh, time because Ericsson is based on a very small country, Sweden, no political power at all, has to fight with a global company, even at that time with a Canadian company like uh, uh, Northern Telecom with a very strong Canadian uh, government support. But uh, Ericsson is a small company and uh, bring up the CSR to be a good business. Then Ericsson was the number one uh, tele uh, telecom and uh, mobile phone manufacturer in China. So CSR definitely will bring the good business to the company. Well, thank you, Jim. 
let's just move on to Brian. Brian, you've been with, uh, you head up the uh, Sinopec operation in Canada, I understand. Uh, and when Sinopec first arrived, first landed in Canada, it picked up many, many assets, including a multi-billion dollar public, publicly traded company. Uh, I'm sure we would be all very interested in hearing about Sinopec Canada's approach vis-a-vis -vis CSR post-acquisition. Now, what are you doing? What is Sinopec Canada doing as far as CSR is concerned vis-a-vis -vis what those Canadian entities were doing before they were picked up by uh, Sinopec? Can you enlighten us on that, Brian? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Bob. Um, you know, I think, candidly speaking, from perhaps the Canadian perspective, there's always concerns with overseas investment and about the commitments to CSR. Um, you know, I can speak from a very personal level on you know, what's happened with Sinopec and Sinopec Canada um, post acquisition of, of the Canadian independent publicly traded company. Uh, it, it was one of the pillars as an independent public community, uh, public uh, company. It has remained that way, and in fact, I would argue that it is stronger today as uh, a subsidiary of, of an international SOE than it was as a public traded uh, company in, in Western Canada. What, what we are is, you know, we are a long-term investor, whether it's in Canada or any of our operations in 27 countries worldwide. And as a part of that long-term strategy, we see sustainability has been absolutely key. Um, CSR investment is a, a, a key foundation of that sustainability. As many of you would be aware, the energy industry has had uh, serious uh, cash issues with low commodity prices over the last two years or so now. Um, one of the things that we have been very proud of in, in Canada and also uh, Sinopec in China is the continuation of uh, all of our CSR investment. So, you know, we absolutely see it as fundamental to our long-term future. And, uh, you know, we're very proud that we have continued, uh, at the very least, uh, the same levels of investment. You mentioned that you're actually doing more in the area of CSR post-acquisition than before. Uh, why is it? I think there's a myth. Uh, people in Canada would tend to think that after you have taken the Canadian entity in private, there would be less, if not, and not more, uh, CSR. Why? Why is it? Because I think we as Canadians, as I mentioned just now, we think that we're the world leader on CSR, and we think that the acquisition, the silent pack acquisition of the Canadian entity should export our CSR into the silent pack family of, of companies worldwide, hence bring the rest of the uh, silent pack standard up rather than vice versa. Yeah, and again, Bob, I think that's a, a misconception purely just, just out of ignorance. Um, you know, if I look at Sinopec parent company's investment in, uh, in China, for example, in 2015, Sinopec invested approximately a billion dollars U.S. in environmental initiatives. Uh, so the, the CSR investment in, in China is, is huge. When I look at the investment uh, in Canada, again, I'll come back to this theme of, of being long-term sustainability. But what we've also done is we've, we've shifted suddenly the, the nature of that investment. Um, corporate branding is less important to us, frankly, and we look at the situation in Western Canada, in Alberta, in the communities where uh, we invest, where we operate, where our staff live. And what we've really done is focused on uh, needs-based organizations. So we're really trying to get right to the front line and make a difference with uh, not just the dollars that we invest, but the volunteer time that we're investing. And, you know, frankly, we're doing that because we believe that it's very important to be 
and hold their good public citizen. And that means not just throwing money at causes, it means, you know, we, uh, we recognize the staff time of, of our employees. We give them credit uh, for the time that they spend volunteering, for example. So, you know, it's, it's the involvement and in being a good corporate citizen and being part of the community is where we are. Thank you, Brian. And sort of a leading, hold that thought. Uh, once again, uh, please, I would encourage you to write down what questions you might have and hand them over to the, uh, to the CCDC staff who are milling around. Uh, sort, of, uh, shifting, uh, sort of leading me from Brian's comment, uh, Jim, you know, you've been in Canada quite a bit recently. You, you, you work with sharks and, oh, you work, not with, but, but you work on sharks in, in China, and I understand you're working on salmons in Canada. Uh, so you, uh, and you've worked with uh, uh, Ericsson, you work with Chinese companies. Uh, how do you see, or do you see any differences between how CSR is applied you know, between Canada and, and China? Can you comment on that, please? Uh, yeah, maybe first I should talk about the story about the salmon in connection with Canada. And uh, two years ago, thanks to the BC tourist and also BC trade office, I had been uh, invited to be the BC Environment Promotion Ambassador to BC uh, for two weeks. I have been to Vancouver quite a few times uh, for skiing, for diving, for boating, and uh, but I've never been to the very mountain of BC. So this is two weeks I have been in BC to see beautiful nature, the conservation, the environment value, the natural capital. And one thing impressed me very much, that was uh, in the uh, late of uh, August, I see huge group of uh, salmon return back from the ocean. And also I heard a story about the salmon recovery, a successful story from uh, uh, Canada. Many years ago, Canada also facing a re re reduced number of salmon, but the scientists, the government, and the social uh, society work together. Now salmon is uh, not only a fish, it's a kind of symbol of uh, BC's uh, 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 spirit. And also salmon is a long history in China. Salmon never give up. They always return back to their home, their root. This is actually is a Chinese uh, mental or their Chinese cultural spirit. Uh, four years ago, the huge salmon population in China along the Qingjiang River, Usuli River, and other river in the north, Pacific salmon in Chinese we call Da Ma Ha Yu. And when I was a child, I read a lot of legend story about it. But today, we, we almost see none of those uh, Chinese salmon. So I learned from Canada that it can be done, can recover if we can get a scientific tour and also we can uh, educate the society for public, uh, for the education. So we are looking back. Thanks for the BC uh, trade office and the Canadian uh, uh, embassy. I got a connection with the BC based Pacific Salmon Foundation and also I bring up 70 uh, Chinese business leaders saying, let's do something, bring Chinese salmon back. So I started an NGO project uh, last year called uh, Let uh, Take Chinese Salmon Home. And uh, then this year, uh, we set up a new foundation called uh, Forever Natural Capital uh, Foundation. It's a first uh, uh, foundation, charity foundation, without uh, any kind of uh, Chinese government uh, supervision. It's uh, independent in China. I believe, and uh, the learning from Canada uh, for the natural uh, beauty or natural resources can help Chinese for, for tree or uh, for their natural treasure. And uh, if, as I said, 20 years ago, Chinese people always say, I could do business, pay the tax, I'm a good company, I'm a, uh, a good citizen. But now they understand. Not only doing a good business, you need it to be a good value to the society. That's uh, now is a very common sense uh, in Chinese uh, uh, company. They always have a CSR uh, a team or so-called uh, 
sales are responsibility uh, focus group lead by their normally is a senior vice president level to, to be responsible. So I think that now is a really uh, good timing for Chinese uh, local. Whenever we call for some kind of uh, good project, they will stand up. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, and and uh, 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 come on, uh, you heard what uh, Jim said just now. And you've heard uh, earlier on, you heard uh, Mr. Chan. He talks about good, entrepre good entrepreneurs uh, are concerned about CSR. We talk about poverty and relief to children. You hear about Mr. Miller talking about bringing awareness of clean water uh, to China. So, how do you, uh, you, know, can you talk about how does that compare with how you see CSR in Canada? Uh, I understand you're also very uh, aware of what's going on in China given your Panda projects. Yeah, I want, I want to underline what, what you just mentioned about home because um, I, I think there is hope. You know, I, I, I painted a very, very big problem, but I think we should, we should work together and uh, implement strategies just like what was suggested and implemented also for the South End. Uh, it's, it's a multi-disciplinary uh, approach. So it's not only coming from the scientists, the biologists in the field. It's not only the expectation to see the business community to fund everything or the government to come with new regulation. We need to work with the local communities. We need to work with the First Nations. We need to embrace that, uh, that, that expectation and collectively, you know, with Calgary's we've been able to reintroduce a variety of, of endangered and extirpated species in Western Canada. But we're also working in Africa, different countries of Africa, working with the local community just to support that so they see value in protecting wildlife in their backyard. And that's the only way that we can build a future. So again, the, the interpreters and the, uh, the business leaders, they, they have to, to show some support and uh, you know, live to the expectation of their employees and uh, go forward. In, in Canada versus China, I, I'm not very familiar with how things are working. I, I, I met with uh, uh, the, the staff from uh, Nature Conservancy in uh, China a few days ago in Beijing, and also from the staff from Forever uh, Nature Capital Fund. Amazing program. Looking forward and connecting, very different approach than what we're doing in Canada. We'll have an education program for school and teachers and the visitors coming to the zoo. We'll talk about this. But the approach that was put forward uh, in, here in China seems to be that they want to connect with the business leaders, and they feel like this is their way to to get and spread the uh, the uh, the hope around. And obviously, they have they have uh, proved that it's working well. Shark fin, tremendous effort, tremendous uh, success, also, and now the salmon. So I think we have different approach, but we share the same goal and the same hope. Well, I'm just going to throw this out, uh, Clement and Brian. You guys from Calgary. And Jim, you are based here in China. Uh, Calgary, we're having some pretty tough time. Uh, the, uh, we don't know when uh, this, this rough time, when the, the economy, when the price of oil uh, is going to turn a corner. So we're getting hit hard by the price of oil. We're getting, getting hit hard by provincial and federal taxes, and also different environmental standards. So corporate leaders, with corporate leaders in Canada, especially in Alberta, see. CSR as a cost center, and do they see the need to tighten the belts, preserve cash, rather than you know, you know just putting more effort, more, maybe putting more funds uh, into the efforts? Uh, you know, would that be would that be actually some concern for CSR in, in, in Alberta? You know, I think it's a natural inclination to, to potentially be in the world like that. And certainly some of the community leaders that I've spoken to in, in southern and central Alberta, there's a general recognition that, you know, overall corporate donations are, are lower at the moment from the energy sector than they have been in, uh, in better pricing environments. Um, you know, I'll say, you know, unequivocal no to the view of it being a, being a cost center. I mean, we, 
we really do view it as a as an investment, as an investment of, of time and effort and dollars. Um, I look at it as being something that is actually more important to be, to be undertaking today um, than it is when the times are good. When the times are good, um, you know, perhaps organizations don't bring the same rigor to, uh, to their CSR. We've certainly been very rigorous in, in, in how we look at our investments. Um, but, you know, we've basically adopted the approach that it's more important right now to continue and maintain those investments than it, than it, than it is even when you know, the quality prices are high. But, uh, you know, I'm on the other side also, and I think that uh, we solicit a partnership, and we're very, very fortunate that the, uh, the support that we have been able to build in the last uh, many years with the corporate sector in Calgary is uh, still strong. Uh, as strong as what we would like to see, no. uh, but the uh, philanthropic community also has stepped in, and uh, they, they are supporting the, uh, the zoo because they see value for the community. So if there's no value for the community, if there's no value for the employees, and uh, so they will, those those investments will be questioned. And uh, to uh, Silovec uh, Canada benefit, you know, I, I, we have a, those tough conversation about their sponsorship of uh, our Chinese Lantern Festival, and uh, they they have decided to, to keep that momentum because they, they thought that was that was providing value for for the community. It's just an example, but we have uh, been able to maintain the relationship regarding some of our very critical uh, endangered species program. Coral Phillips is a, a good example of what they're doing for Ruby Gray. And, uh, I, I can go on with a long list of uh, industries. But it's tougher for sure. Yeah. We are still, by the way, exploring sponsorship for the giant panda coming to Calgary in, in, uh, in a year and a half from now. So, uh, so I'll be available for further conversation. Well, thank you, Clement. And Jim, what kind of dialogue do you have the same type of dialogue uh, in China? Uh, yeah, I think uh, first the answer your uh, first question: whether the CSR is a cost. Certainly, you do either have a cost in the company to do CSR, uh, but the cost is a small, the return is big. For example, uh, 16 years ago, there's a uh, very uh, famous uh, Chinese uh, animal called the uh, Tibetan antelope. Uh, only live in the uh, 500, uh, 5,000 uh, uh, meters uh, uh, altitude above sea level, and uh, used to be over a million pieces. But uh, in 1990s, massive killing was done, less reduced to less than 50,000 pieces, almost uh, in the very bad position. I'm uh, responsible in Arizona for the CSR. I started uh, a program called uh, Arizona's Earth Friend, uh, survive, uh, save our Tibetan antelope. Uh, after the program, successfully implemented one year later, we stopped the massive killing. Then the, I received an email from one of my senior vice president said, our company is uh, so uh, amazing. I'm uh, very much admired uh, uh, your uh, doing. Actually, I was uh, going to resign by competitors that gave up him much better. He's one of our best sales guy leader. Every year, he undertakes about uh, one billion US dollars sales that the com uh, competitor would like to take him in. So I spent a two million RMB for three years program. That's a cost in the market, but I keep this one billion sales guy in the company because he admired the company, the company value. So that's why uh, cost is a important, but uh, the value of the company even more important. Due to that a successful story, now Tibetan Antelope is a return back to the over 300,000 pieces. It's a safe. And the next year, on uh, 5th of 
uh, April Disney natural film uh, is called Born in China, would show the Tibetan animal, uh, grand uh, uh, panda, uh, all these uh, Chinese uh, uh, special pieces uh, worldwide. You will see this uh, beautiful Tibetan animal. They say it now. Well, thank you. I've got some questions here from the audience. Well, this one's, uh, let's make it a two-part question. The first part relates to you, Brian, and the second one will open that up to, to all of us here. Uh, Brian, as a company based both in China and Canada, what are your key environmental objectives, and how are you reconciling these objectives between the two or more countries? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I can speak more specifically to the Canadian opportunities, but I can speak broadly to the, to the Chinese side. You know, I previously mentioned the, the level of investment that Sanitech Group undertakes in its uh, environmental side in, in China, about a billion US dollars in, in 2015. Um, you know, key parts of that on the environmental side are you know, uh, reducing reducing pollution levels, uh, reducing its environmental impact. You know, through that billion dollars investment in 2015 alone, um, approximately 100,000 tons a year of, of, of coal has been taken out of the uh, the energy supply mix in, in China. Um, you know, Sanitec is also the largest single geothermal power provider in China provides geothermal heating for approximately 200,000 homes. So again, if you were to think of that, you know, in, in terms of the Chinese energy mix, that's six to 700,000 tons of coal that would have been required to, to heat those homes. So environmental stewardship, um, air quality, water quality are the key sort of underpinnings of the, of the, 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 the Chinese side. The question on the, on the Canadian side. Let's see, uh, reconciling the objectives between uh, uh, Canada and China, you know, with, within your company. On the on, on the Canadian side, again, we have a significant portion of our efforts goes directly into community investment. Um, when I look at uh, the environmental side, I think one of the huge things that the Canada overall has to offer not just China, but the world, is some of the highest uh, environmental standards for an extractive industry, the energy industry, um, anywhere globally. And I think that you know, Canadians should be very proud of the regulatory environment that, uh, that we operate in in Canada. Um, we're a 10% partner in one of the large LNG liquefied natural gas projects in, in Western Canada. And I think, you know, both from a a corporate perspective, but also equally as, a, as an environmentalist, I think one of the key things is if we can use clean Canadian resources, in this case natural gas, to export LNG to China and replace uh, some of the uh, higher GHG fuels that are currently being used, I think globally that is one of the most responsible things that we can do. And I look at the Canadian government and our regulatory standards, and I think. That's a, you know, that should be something that all Canadians should be very proud of. Well, thank you, Brian. And second part of this question, though, uh, perhaps come on and Jim, you guys can address it more. Uh, is there a scope of cooperation on the environmental sustainability front between Canada and China? Come on, and Jim. You want to? I, either one. Yeah. Uh, actually, yes. And. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the project I kicked off last year is uh, probably the kind of uh, very first uh, environment or conservation project between China and Canada. Uh, we, we use uh, Heilongjiang uh, provincial government support and uh, we, we get the government signed with our DC uh, uh, trade office. And uh, also last month, we invite the uh, Canadian uh, uh, Pacific Assembly Foundation, uh, signed with our uh, foundation, 
uh, in front of the uh, provincial government uh, to be a kind of a conservation exchange and uh, cooperation agreement. And uh, we would like to see more and more Canadian environment and uh, conservation uh, experience and uh, uh, expertise to, uh, to be uh, invited and to work in China. So we got three uh, experts. One is the chairman, the founder of the Canadian Pacific Assembly Foundation. Another is uh, from uh, Canadian Federal uh, Fishery Administration. And uh, uh, they work uh, uh, in on site to Heilongjiang River. And uh, last week, I received great report about uh, their uh, work, survey uh, on site. They said, yes, possible. We can bring the Chinese Trump salmon back if we have a, a work closely. So now we are following the program. The news I report back to uh, my uh, 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 charity board, they are all pleased. So now more and more business leaders started to join us. And also we got uh, uh, Eric Chen, he is uh, based in uh, BC for the fishery business. Uh, and he also is our uh, board member. Uh, this uh, kind of cooperation. I, I would like to say that unlike the business sector, there's not a lot of competition on, this, on the biology and uh, exchange of uh, expertise and experience on, on the uh, side of the environmentalist. So uh, to, when it talks to how we can you know, work more together, I think it's just the resources, the willingness is there to, uh, to work together and uh, this is one expression of that cooperation on the panda. We will be supporting some of the aspect of the research that is conducted at the Chengdu Panda Base and Chongqing Zoo also as an example. And uh, we, this is only uh, one expression of this. The other one is, could be recently there was a connection between Parks Canada and the Chinese Authority because there's a growing uh, expectation to build a park system, I think, in China. And uh, that's something that Canada had been uh, built years ago, and uh, I think we can we can make that uh, that connectivity and share the expertise uh, for the benefit of wildlife and wild places. Uh, thank you, uh, This is such an interesting, such an important, and such a diverse question. You know, we, we heard from three experts coming from three left field, center field, and right field, talking about CSR. In very, in some ways, everything that they talk about, very, very different things which they're doing. But in other ways, there's also a very, very common theme. I mean, uh, that is, a good CSR is good practice, and good practice is good business. There's no question about it. Uh, my own personal experience, I, I work in a law firm. I'm with Blake Castles and Green, been there for about 30 years. When I first joined the firm, law firms, CSR, we don't have birds, we don't have fish, uh, we, don't, we don't have carbon emission. Uh, how do we uh, sort of apply our CSR? Certainly, you know, when I first, joined, when I first uh, joined the profession, we talk about law firms. Within a law firm, we need to have a fit. Now, what is a fit? Nobody knows. It, it's, it's nebulous. But now, the biggest thing which our firm pushes, it's not the recycling of papers. It's not turning off lights. It's not. It's more than using uh, power uh, conservation equipment. It's diversity. It's our people. It's 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 trying to make our our workplace more friendly, more receptive. To uh, I, I was going to say visible minorities, but it's not even visible minorities. It's women. It's people with uh, who look different. People who have different preferences than the quote unquote the mainstream. And you know, that is good business because it allows us to keep good people. So good people do not leave our firm because of, of the tough environment. I, I, you know, we can talk, we can sit here all day and talk about this and this, and, and uh, this is Canada China Business Council. And uh, there's no question about it, there is a strong, very, very strong business case to be made. And incidentally, 
please feel free to visit the CCBC website and look at our own uh, sort of recommended best practice for CSR for Chinese companies in Canada, for Canadian companies in China as well. Uh, we, 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 we've got something that was just completed last year, and I think it's well worth your while to, to visit that. And finally, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to uh, thank Sinopec and thank uh, my, uh, my partners, a number of them are in the crowd today, for sponsoring this session. I'd like to thank Jim, I'd like to thank uh, Clement from the zoo, from, uh, from you know, various foundations in making this such a meaningful session for this great, great event in Shanghai. Thank you once again for attending.